Good morning. You know, the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always, right? And again, I will say rejoice. It also says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, right? You've been through any trials? What if uh, one day you get up, get in your car, you go to work, you arrive, and there's the pink slip?
It's doing right things. First John in chapter 3 says, Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. It means doing righteous things. God wants, or Satan wants you to act in an ungodly way, with anger and bitterness, to lash out, to withdraw, to give up on God, or to invest your life in other things because maybe they're easier than investing your life in Christianity and in God. But don't give in. Keep doing what's right. That is your breastplate. And then it says to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Good news. There is the good news that we have outweighs by far any bad news that Satan tries to throw at us. Listen to these words from Philippians chapter 4. This is uh, the rest of that passage that I quoted earlier about rejoicing in the Lord always and again I will say rejoice. But notice uh, the passage goes on to say, um, finally brethren, verse 8, uh, Philippians chapter 4, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things, the things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things in the God of peace. And the God of peace, and the God of peace will be with you. Don't focus on the bad. Focus on the good. I like what it says in verse 7. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Focus on the good news and not on the bad news. And then it says to take up the shield of faith. With this shield of faith you can extinguish all of those flaming arrows of the evil one. And Satan is always throwing arrows at us, isn't he? Always shooting arrows at us. Maybe the arrow of difficulties to make you doubt God. Maybe the arrow of temptation to make you to draw you away from God. Or maybe the arrow of comfort. Probably don't think of that as an arrow. To make you comfortable enough to where you don't feel like you need God anymore. And whatever it is, he wants you to feel shame and isolate you and not reach out to anyone else to try and deal with it all by yourself. After all, you've got to pull yourself, by, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps because that's what a real person does. And I've tried to envision that in my mind. How does that work, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps? That doesn't work, does it? But Satan wants to make you think that it works. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says, This is a victory that overcomes the world. It's our faith. And we have a song that we sing about that, right? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So, what we need to do is not feed our doubts, not focus on the doubts, not focus on the uh, negative things, but we need to do the things that feed our faith. And if you feed your faith, then your doubts will starve. Then it says to take up the helmet of salvation or deliverance. He's offered you and provided a way of deliverance from bondage. And maybe there is some sin in your life that's been there for so long you've been in, and become so comfortable with, maybe some attitude that's been there for so long you become so used to that you become numb to it and don't even realize that you're still in bondage. And what do you do about that? You know, James chapter 5, verse 16 says that we need to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And I'm convinced that's not talking just about physical things, but that's talking about our uh, spiritual things, the things that hold us in bondage, whether it's some sin in our life or whether it's some ungodly kind of attitude. The one thing that you can do to make it lose all of its power is to take it out of the darkness and put it into the light. And the way you do that is with confession. The only sin that can hold you in bondage is the unconfessed sin, and it draws its power from the darkness. But when you take it out of the darkness and expose it to the light, it shrivels up and it loses its power. So don't isolate yourself. And then it also says to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword. The one piece of equipment here, the one piece of offensive equipment, and by the way, it's also a defensive piece of equipment too, isn't it? The sword is. It does both. But the one piece of offensive equipment here, I've noticed, is associated with the Word of God. 
And you know, it doesn't matter how much armor you have. You can have the thickest helmet, the biggest breastplate, and, and uh, the biggest shield. If you do not have a sword, sooner or later you will be overcome. This is indispensable. This is indispensable. The only way you can fight off Satan's lies is with his truth. And you find his truth in here. The sword is indispensable. And so what this reminds us is that we need to spend plenty of time in the Word of God and learn to master it and learn to live our lives according to the way that God instructs us in his Word. And to be able to see the world around us, not through the eyes of the world, not through the eyes of Satan, but to see the world around us through the eyes of God and see ourselves through the eyes of God. That's why the Word of God is so important. In fact, John chapter 8, Jesus says, If you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Continuing in his word. And then, I know a lot of people don't associate this with the armor, but uh, the last thing that's mentioned in the passage is to pray at all times. Pray at all times. Making petition at all times. And I noted when I was counting, uh, uh, counting the list here of all these items, it actually makes item number seven is prayer. Prayer. What is prayer? It's simply communication with God. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says to pray without ceasing. And I remember one day when I was reading... I read Ecclesiastes chapter 5 that said when you go to the house of the Lord, uh, let your words be few. And so <laughs> maybe it has something to do with the fact, have you ever tried to pray all night long like, like Jesus did before? I mean, if you're praying, you're trucking along really good, how long does that last before you just seem to run out of things to pray about and you run out of things to say and you feel like you want to just fill the air with words? But, you know, I'm not sure that that is necessary. You know, Romans chapter 8 says sometimes we just don't know what to say. And the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Even when we don't know what to say, guess what? We have the Spirit interceding for us. Or maybe it's kind of like, you know, when you're spending time with your loved one, you're having a really good conversation, and after a while it gets quiet. Does that mean that you don't care for each other anymore? Does it mean you don't love each other? No. You're just spending time together. And I think that's a kind of prayer as well. And maybe that's part of what Jesus did when he spent the entire night in prayer. Prayer, all kinds of prayer, helps to feed your faith and starve your doubts. I want to go back to the 73rd Psalm. And I want you to notice how this uh, psalmist resolves the crisis of faith in his life. So after saying, you know, I've been a Christ, I've been a, a believer in God, and it's been all for nothing because people seem to do better without God than, than I do. Notice uh, what he says in verse 16 of the 73rd Psalm. He says, "When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. It was vexing him. He didn't know what to make of this. He was probably in tears. He was a." Uh, uh, lost sleep at night, he, he got angry, he was bitter, it was troublesome in my sight, in verse 17, until I came into the sanctuary of God. His perspective changed when he prayed. His perspective changed when he worshipped God. And then he says, then I proceed to their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction how they are destroyed in a moment and are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream, like a dream, when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. The day is going to come when all of this difficulty is going to seem nothing more, like nothing more than a distant dream. In verse 21, he says, When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, okay, this stabbed me to the core of my being, he says, Then I was senseless and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Can you relate to that? Have you ever been so embittered by the things that were going on in your life because you were under such attack that you just felt embittered and you were like a beast? But he says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, with your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, 
I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. It's almost as if the psalmist is saying, Satan, do your worst. There's nothing that you can do to me. My body may fail. My body may fail. But the nearness of God is my good. I desire nothing else but the nearness of God. And there's nothing, nothing that can ever take that away. It's like the passage that Terry read earlier. It doesn't mean when we face difficulty that God loves us any less. In fact, I'm convinced it's because God loves us all the more. You know, one of the passages in the Bible talks about discipline and how when a parent loves their child, they discipline their children, and sometimes the children don't understand. You ever tried to reason with a child? <laughs> sometimes they don't understand, and you're fighting a losing battle sometimes when you try to reason with them, but you go on with discipline anyway. And you, when, the, when they feel like, oh, I'm so deprived because you won't give me this thing, and I remember telling one of my boys, because I care about you and I love you. Oh, I wish you didn't care about me so much. But we do care, right? And God cares. And so it's not because He loves us less, but it's because He loves us more. You know, I read a phrase last week. Uh, I'm trying to remember how it went. It went, uh, there are some times in life when truth in the heart is more important than food in the belly. And that's what God's training is all about. Put on the full armor of God. And realize that Satan is powerless to destroy your faith. So if you're feeling any kind of doubt or bitterness or weakness, my encouragement to you is don't isolate yourself. Sometimes we want to try and, and deal with it all together on our own. Don't isolate yourself. And the way you keep from isolating yourself, number one is through prayer, and number two is through fellowship. We draw strength and encouragement from one another and we draw strength from God when we pray together. So don't isolate yourself. I'm going to close this morning by reading the passage from the Scripture reading one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want, these to, I want, to let, I want you to let these words resonate in your ears as the last thing you hear from the lesson this morning and take them with you. And remember, remember, even though you may feel like one person against all kinds of stuff coming against you, that one man and God always make a majority. Okay, so listen to these, uh, listen to these words. Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. One man and God always make a majority. You know, I'm reminded of a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you ever go to the bookstore or go to the library and you see uh, uh, anything about his life, that's, that's worthy reading. This was a man who took seriously his faith in Christ. And at the time, he was a minister in Germany uh, throughout the 30s and into World War II, and he, re and he rejected the efforts of the uh, Nazi party to turn the church into a uh, state church and to go along with the Nazi regime. And he eventually was arrested, put into prison, 
and uh, executed by Hitler's regime. And here's one of the things that he says about facing difficulty in life. I don't remember if he wrote this in prison or before he went into prison. But he says this, The wondrous theme of the Bible that frightens so many people is that the only visible sign of God in the world is the cross. Christ is not carried away from the earth to heaven in glory, but must first go to the cross. And precisely there, where the cross stands, the resurrection is near. Even there, where everyone begins to doubt God, where everyone despairs of God's power, there God is whole, there Christ is active and near. Where the power of darkness does violence to the light of God, there God triumphs and judges the darkness. We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning. And if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to the front as we stand and sing.